Okay, hello everyone. Uh, we are back for our fifth uh, webinar. And this time we have the pleasure to have our guest uh, right from, coming right from Vienna, is Lucas Plan. He is a senior geologist researcher in the Natural History Museum of Vienna. And he's also an active caver in the Spirological Society of Vienna and the Lower uh, Alps. Uh, Lucas will talk about the Austria. Yeah, about, sorry, Lower Austria. Sorry, uh, Lucas will talk about the <laughs> easternmost one kilometer deep cave in the Alps, and we are very excited to have him with us this time. So, Lucas, internet is all yours. Okay, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Christos, thanks for the introduction. Uh, yes, I will talk about the Mount Hochschwab Karst Massif and the deepest cave in that Karst Massif. It's the Steinbock Schacht. Steinbock is a Capricorn, the Capra Epex. And yeah, as you will see, it was discovered in 2011. On this first slide, you can see an aerial photograph. Actually, it's stolen from Vienna Waterworks, pointing towards the east view towards the east, you have a lot of clouds in the valleys, and I hope you can see the, the, the mouse. And here about is the summit of Hochschwab, which is 2,277 meters above sea level. Can you hear me, actually? Yes, okay. I have problems to... Okay, um, I hope you are a bit familiar with the Alps. So here you can see the, the eastern part, let's say, of the Eastern Alps. Here's the city of Vienna. This is a satellite image. So either cities are pink or high mountainous areas. Here's the city of Linz and the Danube River. And actually the Alps, the eastern margin of the Alps is here at the Vienna Basin. And maybe some of you are familiar with the huge karst massifs like Dachstein. Here you can see Dachstein with the, in blue, the small glacier, or Totesgebirge also hosts a lot of caves, and the longest cave in Austria, which is Schönberg Höhen System, which uh, reached a length of 150 kilometers last year. But we will mainly focus on Hochschwab, which is much further to the east. And this is a huge uh, limes, a huge tectonic block of limestone. It's called the Northern Calcareous Alps. And this yellow outline uh, marked the, the margin of the Northern Calcareous Alps. Yeah, here's Dachstein Totes Gebirge. And we will zoom now into Hochschwab. This is a map of Hochschwab. Uh, the red outline, the red, the red line is the outline of Hochschwab. The summit is here, almost 2,300 meters, as I as mentioned before. And all the dots are caves. Uh, the yellow ones are the small ones, 5 to 50 meters. Orange are 50 to 500, red ones are 500 to 5,000, and only two of them are uh, pink on Hochschwab, which is Hirschgrubenhöhle, we will see later on, is more than five kilometers long, and Fraunmauerhöhle is much longer. It is 40, almost 43 kilometers now. The valley in the north is the Salza River. It's quite deep. It's about 650 meters above sea level. And in the south, the valleys are about, let's say, 900 meters. So there is a potential of almost 1,500 meters from the summit to the, to the Salza Valley. Uh, we will have this, this map several times. And I will show you now some, some pictures from the surface of Hochschwab. This is, again, a view towards the east. The summit is highlighted here. And in the foreground, this is not a dense forest, but this is Mugo Pines. Pinus Mugo is a, also called Dwarf Mountain Pine. 
it's really nasty uh, if you if you have to search for caves and if you if you got stuck in the middle of such uh, it's only maybe one meter high but really super nasty and and and, and shitty if you have to go through so if you got stuck in in, in some mugo pine field or forest or whatever like this you are you have a problem This is a view again towards the summit. Here's the summit. And you can see on the one hand, this rather gentle slopes with, with some grassy vegetation. And then you have this glacial cirques where you can see a very high density of, of entrances of caves. Uh, in my opinion, it's because the glacier unroofed the cave, they eroded the top of the caves. And so you have a very high density of caves in that area. It's not. I don't think that the glacier really formed that caves. Here you can see the Schistel House. It's a mountain hut, which at 2,150 meters above sea level, which is normally our base camp. This is a glacial cirque in the north. It's called Oberer Ring, with a very nice wall of about 400 meters high. And here, this is viewed towards the west, and here is the Hochschwab summit again. Uh, sometimes we also used, uh, we, we camped here, it's called Hocharm at about two, uh, 1,800 meter, 1,700 meter above sea level. But most of the times we used this schistel house. It's very modern. There was an old one at this place, uh, was built more than 120 years ago. And for almost 20 years now, we have this high tech building with, with a lot of solar power and, and everything. And down here, this is view towards the north, down here is the Salza Valley at 650 meters above sea level. So the only way to get up here is hiking. Normally it takes four hours, 1000 meters uh, elevation to hike up, but uh, sometimes we get a permission to drive here to Edelbodenalm, then it's only two and a half hours. But we uh, often use helicopter that uh, supply the hut that brings up our caving gear. So we don't have to carry all the ropes and all the stuff. Some words on the surface morphology of the Hochschwab. Uh, there is huge door lines. This one, for example, is 300 meters long and 130 meters wide and about 60 meters deep, approximately here. Uh, oh, sorry, the, the the circle is at the wrong position. Here, a person is, is at the mouse pointer. Here, a person is standing. So we will mainly focus on the, on the caves in the center of the area and then skip to Steinbockschacht, which is located here. Uh, Few a uh, few kilometers west of the Hochschwab summit. But first, I will show you some other caves of Hochschwab. Uh, yeah, this is also interesting. Hochschwab is um, a major source for drinking water for the city of Vienna. So here is the so-called Kleferquellen. It's a major cast spring, one of the, the actually the, the the biggest one in the Eastern Alps, with an average discharge of about 5,000 liters per second, so five cubic meters per second, and a maximum discharge of about five, uh, 50 cub, cub, cubic meters per second. And this is a picture in spring. Actually, it's not one opening, but it's a bunch of, of springs here. You can see out of this slope, at least seven, eight major springs uh, bring their water down to the Salza River. This is a drone photograph. And yeah. so minimum discharge is 500 liters per second. Average is about 5,400 and maximum is almost 50 cubic meters per second. And already in 1905, the spring was an edit was dug to capture the, the spring uh, subsurface. And here you can see the water and which is flowing to the city of Vienna 
and it's one of about 30 springs that uh, deliver water for the city of Vienna. So Vienna gets about 95% of karstic water from uh, mountainous catchments. Also, there are some in the in the valley. There are some accessible caves, at least during low water. This is one of them. It's called Gleffergrotte. Uh, during snowmelt, which is uh, occurring right now, uh, this gallery is completely filled with water, and maybe some cubic meters of water escape from that cave. But normally, you can enter about 120 meters, and then big boulder chalk where the water comes from. And this is a cave that is not active anymore, but that was a former outlet of Gleferquelle. We started exploration in 1996, where we, per incident, the first cave we discovered, or we, we, the first hole we went to, became one, one major cave. It's called Fut Ovi Schacht. Fut Ovi is Styrian dialect, means further down, so the pit goes further down. The steering guy told us uh, there is a pit that goes further down, and he was right. It uh, became 713 meters deep and was the deepest cave for several years. Here you can see the entrance in winter. This cave, because of water, it's, uh, normally we only go there in winter because in summer it's uh, not safe. You can have floods. If there is thunderstorm outside, you will it will get not flooded, but you will have waterfalls within a very short time, half an hour maybe. Some impressions, vertical shafts with a diameter of a few meters, but in between there are quite narrow, nasty canyons. Here you can have you can see a vertical uh, narrow spot at minus 300, especially between 300 and 350, it's very nasty because it's so narrow. There is only one small place where, oops, sorry, only one small place where you can put a bivouac at minus 350. So three people can, it's, yeah, it's, if, if there are three people, it's very cozy and warm. But if one, one, one guy or one, one girl is turning during the night, all the others have to do it as well. Yeah, and again, narrow paths, a little bit of water under extreme low flow condition. Under high flood conditions, it's not a good idea to be there. Oops, sorry. This is a vertical section of Fuerto uh, So the entrance is at 1,780, and it goes down 712 meters. Bivac is approximately here. The deepest pit is Angsana Moon Schacht, which is 73 meters deep. But you have a lot of very small uh, repels in between. And especially this canyon here, this passage, this Knoblauch Canyon, Garlic Canyon, uh, is very nasty. Uh, this, this cave is mainly or is, is entirely developed in Middle Triassic limestone of the Wetterstein formation, it's called, along uh, major faults, steeply dipping faults that dip to the east. The next cave I want to introduce is Pol Monster Doline. So it's a huge tall line. You, of course, you can see the person in the foreground, but I don't know how good is your. Uh, resolution, but here is another person and another person. So it has a diameter of almost 100 meters times 60 meter, and here you can see the snow 60 meter below the surface. The entrance is at almost 1,000, at almost 2,000 meters, and it's almost 400 meters deep and 1.5 kilometers long. So here you can see the section of this tall line with the snow. And there is a small canyon leading into a shaft. And then we, we here we entered a new shaft and we're throwing down rocks. And it turned out that the shaft is a 209 meter single drop. Here is the narrow, this narrow section above this shaft. 
Und das Schaf, die Kalt Lumpi, uh, is 209 meters deep. And down there at almost minus 400 or 380 to be precise, we found a huge chamber we called after the names of the surveyors, Katharina, Michi, Lukas, Matthias, Kami, Luma chamber. It's almost uh, 5,000 square meters or more. Uh, we, we, we will see later on. So 130 meters in diameter approximately. Here you can see a person, huge boulders, huge cone of, of debris coming into this chamber. And here you see, can see uh, the survey of, this, of the doll line at the surface and this huge chamber, 135 times 130 meters, uh, 380 meters below. Another cave quite close is Kalter Hinternschacht, means a uh, frozen ass pit. It's uh, on, the, on the north north of, of Pol Monster Doline and there could be a chance to connect these two caves but there is still there is a boulder chalk and we didn't try again so it's still not connected but as you have two entrances at different altitudes and this one is the lower entrance there is very uh, strong air draft and so it's an ice cave there is permanent ice nice ice part but it's also cold if you have to survey it. It's 445 meters long and 100, almost 150 meters deep. Uh, partly it's quite big because this cave is not only developed in Wetterstein limestone, but also in Wetterstein dolomite. And surprisingly, in Monster Doline and in, in this Kalter Hinternschacht, if you enter the Dolomite, it's getting much bigger. The diameters of the galleries and chamber are changing to much bigger ones in the Dolomite. Quite nice big galleries, which are uh, rather unusual for Hochschwab. One more cave is Hirschgrubenhöhle. This is the longest cave we found on Hochschwab. It's 5.6 kilometers long and 200 meters deep. And the entrance is about 1,900 meters above sea level. So this is the main hiking trail uh, crossing Hochschwab. And here in this very small line, you can uh, walk down into that cave. We often beat this cave in winter with skis, cause yeah, it's 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 nice. You, you can do it in winter. You can easily find the entrance because it's always the snow is always blown away. If also if there are maybe one or two meters of snow down here in the valley, this spot there is always windy and and the snow is blown away, and you just dig if you know the right spot. You dig a small hole and can slide into the cave and can change clothes and. Yeah, this is a small hole to enter the cave, and then you have a five kilometer long cave to explore. Uh, it's quite unusual that you have so much spell attempts, so much dripstones at caves at that elevation, because there is almost no vegetation, or at least presently there's no vegetation. So, the, there's no, not a lot of spellotons in the caves, but Hirschgrubenhöhle is an exception. Some parts of the caves are really nicely decorated. Maybe not if you compare it to caves in, in Greece, but at least for, for alpine, alpine caves, it's, it's a lot of spellotons. Small pool with crystals. And this is really, uh, in, in, in one part, it's quite dry. And this is the only part where you can drink from these crystal pools. My, my, my colleague here uses a small pipe for drinking. We have also some uh, vertical parts in Hirschgrubenhöhle. This is a pit that goes down approximately to 160 meter below the entrance. And you have to rappel down here, 80 meter deep pit. 
here you can maybe see the rope and then it's a nice chamber maybe 30 meters in diameter with huge boulders and also close to the lowest point 100 80 meters below the entrance. There's also one part going 20 meters above the entrance, so the total vertical range is 200 meters. But here at minus 180, again, you have some nice spell attempts, at least for alpine caves. One more cave we explored uh, is Spätbodenhöhle. It's quite high, it's at 2,100 meters above sea level. The entrance is pit here, as you can see, and it's what is quite unusual. It's almost horizontal, and it's 1.9 kilometer long and 277 meters deep. And so you have these horizontal parts, and surprisingly, there are also some lakes. This is the so-called Bikini Lake. And it got its name from, we had a funny night after caving, we came back to Schistel House, and in the cellar we always uh, party. And during the party they told us, ah, we discovered this lake, and I said to some girls, ah, okay, tomorrow we, we take some pictures in bikini. And they said, yes, of course, uh, but only if you also wear a bikini. So, okay, we continued with partying, and next morning I woke up, and they gave me a bikini, and so we had to go back to the lake to make the pictures. And here you can see bikini pictures. And we also fell down into the lake. We tried not to, but it was so slippery that we fell down into the lake. And it's close to an uh, ice body in the cave, so the water was almost uh, about zero degrees. And this is one picture from the from the deep parts, from these vertical parts in that cave that go down to 277 meters below the entrance. Also some decoration with speleotherms, this, this white stuff, but nice, nice vertical pits. Okay, now we come to Steinbock Schacht. It is one of several hundred openings you can find here is a, a small second entrance so i was doing my phd on hochschwab and was mapping the whole area for cosmological mapping uh, in order to make vulnerability studies to check which parts are more vulnerable more sensitive to pollution and which parts are not so that the waterworks can take measures to protect uh, these highly vulnerable areas. And during the field mapping, I mapped some six, 700 cave entrances. And we still are busy with exploring all that, cave, all that caves. And in 2011, uh, we always, always make quite international teams on Hochschwab for these expeditions. And Hungarian guys explored this Pit, among many others, and found uh, first at minus 30 meters, they found a horizontal part, and then nice pits going further down. So we, just to have a, again the, the overview map, so we were talking, I was talking now about uh, Furt Ovischacht, then we had Pol Monster Turine and Kalter Hinternschacht, um, Hirschgrubenhöhle, Spätbodenhöhle, and now we are here at Steinbockschacht. Schistel, Hochschwab Summit is here, and Schistelhaus is approximately here. So from, from Hochschwab Summit, or from Schistelhaus, actually, you walk approximately two hours to get to Steinbockschacht. Yeah, again, the catchment of the Kletterquelle. So all the caves we have mentioned now, I have mentioned now, are uh, within the catchment of the Kleferquellen. So this is the more or less horizontal part in Steinbock Schacht. Of course, it's not just a walking passage. You, it goes up and down, maybe five meters up, five meters down, traverse of pit or some scree slopes like here. 
Here's a, a Swiss guy joined us, Diego Sanz, and especially Hungarian guys in Steinbockschlacht. These are super nice pictures from a Hungarian cave photographer. Her name is Agnes Berentes. Probably my pronunciation of Hungarian is terrible, but yeah. So this is the so-called almost 100 meter deep pit because it's only 98 meters deep, which leads from this, which is the continuation from this horizontal part. Again, fast 100 meter shaft, almost 100 meter pit. And then there follows a canyon. Uh, it's not narrow, it's always at least half a meter or one meter wide with several small drops of 10 to 20 meters and one boulder chalk in between. Here is again, the upper part is upper Jurassic limestone, it's Dachstein kalk, which is which occurs only in very few areas on Hochschwab. And now we are in a thin bedded uh, middle Jurassic limestone Grafensteig kalk, it's called. There is also a nice chamber called Jenga Halle. Maybe you know this, this game. Jenga, you have to remove small uh, boxes uh, without, uh, so that the, other, uh, that the others uh, should not move. And in this chamber, there are some instable boulders, so you have to move very carefully, or at least at the beginning after the discovery. Meanwhile, they are in a more stable position. This is at approximately, approximately minus 200, and close to that chamber is the only place or the, the best place for a bivouac in the cave. But there is no flat ground, so the Hungarian guys uh, constructed these portal edges. So it's an al aluminum frame with a, with a plastic uh, attached to the wall, and you can sleep quite well. We have this, this rain cover here and four of these pop lodges uh, to sleep. Of course, this is just for trial. Of course, we have nice sleeping bags and we don't, we, we don't wear the overall and the boots for sleeping. Temperature in the cave is about two, maybe three degrees in the upper part. In the lower part, theoretically, it gets warmer. And after, oops. So discovery was in 2011. Uh, and then in the same year and in the, in the next year, the, the, the Jenga Halle down to minus 200 was discovered. And the next bit got uh, named Niagara Falls. Uh, they tried to go down, the Hungarians tried to go down, but were stopped by the water. And then for, I'm not, I'm not sure, one or two years, it was not possible to go, to go down. And after that, they discovered a huge pit uh, where the rocks fall several seconds. And finally, it turned out that it's a 250 meter single drop. And this is, a bottom, this is the bottom of this pit. So it's about seven, eight meters wide. And it continues with, with a huge canyon. This is a vertical view down. So despite many other pits, you don't see any boulders here. It's completely blank, completely bare rock. And only in the, in the canyon further down, you can see the boulders. So during flood conditions uh, here, approximate, here uh, probably here is a big waterfall going down. Here again, you can see this, the bottom of the pit and this huge, Canyon. Yeah. So this is at, at minus 550. The team of this is Pauline, Leto, and Jurzi, two Hungarian guys, and me. So this is the section of the cave until uh, bottom of Nichtwarschacht. It's it's not true pit. Is this 250 meter single drop? So here's the entrance, then some small drops and this more or less horizontal part. Tolerancia Galeria, then the almost 100 meter drop. Bivak and Cenga Halle are here. Niagara Falls. 
And in August 2016, we reached a depth of 600, 603 meters where we ran out of rope. This uh, Nichtwarschacht, not only the, the depth is quite amazing, but also the diameter. Here is a detail of the longitudinal section. Uh, so you are here at some wall and cannot even see all the walls. So there are a lot of hidden spaces. You, I, I tried to make some, some profiles, but it was not completely possible. And the biggest diameters are 35 times 25 meters in this 250 meter drop. And there is one part, it's called Vogelnetz, bird's nest, uh, where maybe two people can sit next to each other and everything else is vertical and you're just on rope. This is approximately minus 700. The loge, it's a, again, a begin, the, the beginning of a 70 meter drop, a small place where you can rest and, and, and drink some tea or, or grab some food to continue the journey further down. And here we stopped in 2017 at minus 750 or 748, I guess it was. And again, the, the top of a major pit. And if you, we, we were throwing down rocks and it was falling for six, seven, six seconds. So we estimated another 150 meters. After that, we decided that we, because in summer it's difficult because of the water you have to have very stable weather conditions. So in summer, it's normally not possible, but because you, are, you always have to be aware of thunderstorms in the Alps, uh, only in, in, yeah, in fall, August, September, October, there are more stable weather conditions where you can predict the weather more precisely uh, and can go into the cave uh, safely. So, and also in winter, of course, if there is a cold period and there is snow outside, the water cannot enter the cave and it's safe. So we, ah, sorry, this is again the, the, the vertical section. Now we are at minus 738, not 734, 738 it was in October uh, 27. Oops. And then we decided that we've, fix a net above the entrance. So it's not uh, filled, it's not plugged with snow in winter. This is the, the, the construction out of ropes. And then we put a, a thin net. So the idea was not uh, a thin net so that at least in spring water can enter the cave and remove the snow. And this was uh, December 2017. We tried to, or we, we managed to go to the cave, even though in winter with skis and all the additional equipment, uh, shovel, uh, avalanche uh, stuff, all the bivouac equipment, and it, it was quite hard. And also there are several uh, parts to get there, which, uh, which were quite dangerous. So we were able to enter the cave, but finally, as the weather forecast was quite bad and the cave was sucking air so strong that a lot of snow was uh, sucked into the cave. And we were too much afraid that after three days when we come out, that the entrance is completely blocked and when you're already tired and then you have to dig from inside, maybe at least 10 meters out to get to the surface. And then you are in some bad weather and avalanches and so on. So we, we, we skipped the idea of going into the cave in winter. Yeah, this is this net. We, we managed to free it and below the, the pit was open, but we went into the cave, uh, brought all the, left all, all the, the ropes and equipment and food, and, but gave up the idea of going there in winter. It's too dangerous because of avalanches and, and the outside conditions, even though in the cave, it, it is much safer. So we continued from 740 in two years ago, 2018. And 
what we estimated of 150 meters actually was a 100 meter pit, then maybe four meters of, 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 of scree slope, and then another at least 100 meter drop. But there water was entering and we could escape to another pit. So we don't know where it continues further down. This is the this traverse. So we came down here, here's the water. So we tried to, or actually Hungarians did the rigging, uh, tried to escape the water, managed to reach this window. And after five meters, there was a next pit, which was a bit drier, even though not completely dry, but at least a bit drier. And this is, uh, oops, this was a short rest after serving from 740 down to 1040. So this is almost at uh, 1020. This is not the deepest point at that time, but it is, this is 1020. So we had a stove, cook, made some soup uh, and, and Another, another 100 meters of rope we, we left there for further explorations. So this was map after September 2018. The Loge Schacht is a 90 meter, 105 and at least uh, 99 meter, but it continues. And then we changed here into that uh, little bit drier system. And here the water escapes further down and we went on here. Last September, uh, this is a, a team of Hungarians. Unfortunately, they arranged a, a date where the group from Vienna couldn't join. So the Hungarians went alone and they were lucky with the weather and could continue. This is a, again one picture of the nicht the 250 meter drop going down to 550. And at the bottom, uh, what they discovered was a bit different to the to the other parts. So it gets more or less phreatic. It's not it's not completely clear if it's if it's maybe still flooded or not. But the the gal the the character of the galleries completely change and it gets much more narrow and dirty. Only small drops, few meters, and then again crawlways and, and, and uh, not so easy stuff, no, not just vertical, deep vertical pits to go down. And then there is a, a small brook down there, a small stream. So I haven't been to this part. I can just comment the, the pictures and the, and the stuff the Hungarians told me. And nice tube. So this, of course, is, is phreatic or epiphreatic. And a siphon, but this is not a, a terminal sump. At the bottom, this is a, a sump where water. Uh, so this is a spring, actually, a spring sump. So water uh, emerges from that sump and goes down into a very narrow fissure. But there are still one fissure maybe can be enlarged or there is other wet pits that go further down. So this is the team that reached the bottom. And now is the complete survey. This part was discovered last year in September 2019. And the deepest point is 1,082 meters below the entrance. So this is the spring where the water comes out and then uh, disappears in narrow fissures. This one maybe can be enlarged, or there is this pit that goes maybe at least 100 meters down, or this pit also goes down. But they are both, they are quite wet, and, and so we try to go into this dry part. But uh, it seems it makes more sense to continue here in this in these pits with the water. Okay, so once again, the position of Hochschwab, and I will now present a east-west section approximately reaching from here to, to here. 
and then one north-south profile where you can see Steinbock Schacht uh, and the other caves. So this is the complete, complete east-west section with Ebenstein summit at 2,100 meters and the foot over Schacht. We learned about Pol Monster Doline, Hirschgrubenhöhle, Steinbock, uh, Speikbodenhöhle and now Steinbock Schacht. This is the valley bottom in the north with the Salza River and the Klefferquellen we have seen. So actually, this is the, the base level. And here is the zoom. If we zoom in, yeah, we can, we can see this. This is the valley bottom in the south, which is about 900 meters above sea level. And the valley, the blue line is the valley in the north, the Salza River, about 650 meters above sea level. Hochschwab Summit, Schistelhaus would be somewhere here, our base camp. And here is Stangenwand, Hochwart is 2,200 meters and at 2,020 is the entrance of Steinbockschacht. And this is a north-south profile. Uh, it's two times uh, vertically exaggregated. So Hochschub is not that steep, but uh, to in order to fit it, that the fit is better in the, on on the on this window, I I I made it two times higher. So here you have the summit and the Steinbock Schacht penetrating almost vertically down to 940 meters above sea level or 1,082 meters below the entrance. So this is the base level in the north at 746. Uh, and if we assume this is the highest overflow of Klefferquelle, which is about 100 meters above the Salzer level, and a rise of the, of the water table with, I estimated from, from uh, values from other karst areas in the Alps, maybe karst water table rises with 1.5 degrees, then we have another 100 meter uh, down to reach the cast water table in Steinbock Schach. In theory, it would be still possible that uh, Steinbock Schacht uh, dewaters to the south, to Bodenbauer, because there the groundwater level is at 830 meters. So it's another 100 meters down to the groundwater level at Bodenbauer in the south. This is a list of the deepest caves of Hochschwab. The orange ones were explored by expeditions uh, organized by the Spilologic Society of Vienna and Lower Austria. Uh, so it's Steinbock Schacht, 1082. Futtorbe Schacht, we already heard about, is 730, 13 meters long. Frauenmauer Langsteinhöhle, it's a long cave system with 43, almost 43 kilometers, is also 633 meters uh, deep, but don't have these uh, extreme vertical drops like the other caves have. Melkboden Eishöhle, I have to mention, it's uh, 540 meters deep, but has uh, the deepest single pit in Austria, which is 450. There's a one single drop of 450 meters. We, I showed you Pol Monster Bouline, minus 386, and Speikbodenhöhle with a vertical range of 277 meters. What's the rank in the, in the, in the deepest caves of Austria? At presently, there are 17 caves deeper than 1,000 meters in Austria. The Lambrechtshofen is the deepest one with a depth of 1,735. It became almost 100 meters deeper two years ago because they find a higher entrance to that cave. And at the moment, Steinbock Schacht is at uh, the 13th position with its 1,082 meters. By the way, Lambrechtshofen, I think, is the fifth Fourth or fifths, I don't know at the moment. 
I think it's the fourth fourth deepest cave in the in the world. And the longest cave of Hoch, of Hochschrock, of, of course, Fraunmauer Langsteinhöhlen system, it's much longer than all the others. It's mainly explored by guys from Graz and uh, Eisenerz. And then Hirschgrubenhöhle, Steinbockschacht, Potentialschacht with uh, lengths in between 2000 and 5500 meters. And then also Furtogeschacht is 1600 meters long, Polmontaduline. And also these two, but actually, these two Schwarze Lacken, oh, it's, it's wrong. It was not done by our club. It was done by, sorry for it's, it's, it's the wrong, the wrong uh, color. Arzberghöhle uh, was reserved by, by us. Here is a map of Austria with all the caves deeper than 1000 meters. They're all located in the, almost all are located in the central parts of the Northern Calcareous Alp. Else only one cave, Fechner Schachthöhle is out of, is in the, in the austro alpine crystalline in some metamorphic uh, uh, calcareous schist. And here is Lamprechtsofen, the deepest one. And all the others are in Tennengebirge, Hagengebirge, Untersberg, Dachstein, Totensgebirge. And now we have a 1000 meter cave here in Hochschwab much more to the east. So presently in the, in the central part of Hochschwab, there are uh, about 700 caves, about 500 of them were surveyed by us or by, by explorations organized by, by our club. And if I put the, there are 800, at presently there are 800 more entrances. We just know the coordinates and the rough estimate from the entrance. Just I threw a note inside, how many meters it goes down and made a note. So it's all these blue dots you can see are uninvestigated, unexplored caves. And most probably there are some more that are quite deep and quite long or challenging caves. Few words. Uh, we also do some scientific projects on in the caves on Hochschwab. This, for example, is uh, here we measure. This is a, a Thomson wire, wire where we measure the discharge and electric conductivity and temperature in Furtogeschacht, uh, uh, 100 meter below the entrance. And my colleague Eva Kaminski just finished her master thesis on the on the data from this station, and tried to make some modeling. But this is only 100 meters below the entrance and never dries out. And there we have discharges between 0 0.003 liter per second, so almost nothing, but it never dries out, and about 20 liters per second, so a factor of 6,000 something between the minimum and the maximum. Yeah, I, I don't want to go into detail. These are the curves from that, from that uh, station. Uh, another nice story we found in Hirschgrubenhöhle and there we found some broken spellow tents like this one, which is not Unusual for alpine caves because you have at least during the during the Pleistocene during the cold periods you had some uh, frost also some some permafrost also inside the caves which destroyed uh, could can destroy spellotems but in in these caves it's in Hirschgrubenhöhle in one part is different because also this massive uh, flowstone on the floor was cracked. And then we found some strange uh, scratches at the wall. They were up to 30 centimeters long. And stalagmites that were sheared off from the ceiling moving against the floor. So an active fold is cutting through the galleries and sheared off spell attempts, scratched the flowstone on the walls and, and, and caused this damage to the, to the spell attempts. And there we could, we, we, uh, drilled for sampling and 
could make some uranium thorium ages of uh, at least 10 samples. And they showed us that there was uh, this deformation was between 9,100 9, and 118,000 years. So there was a, is a big hi hiatus because this is the the Würmian uh, glacial period where there is, was no spelotem uh, formation because it was uh, ground above the cave was frozen. Uh, but during that time, this major tectonic event happened. So this is almost the end of my talk. Uh, our work is partly supported by Vienna Water. We can buy some ropes and they uh, finance the the stay at the hut and the helicopter flights and, and, and stuff like that. And especially the Spelelogic Society of Vienna and Lower Austria. Of course, the place where I work, the Natural History Museum, and our friends from Hungary, which are members of the Tolerancia Caving Club in Budapest. As I told you, we on Schistelhaus, when we come back from the cave, almost always some schnapps is waiting for us, some nice Zirben schnapps or some gin or whatever. And this is the, the cellar of the hut where we sometimes, when we were successful, celebrate some nice parties. I thank you for your uh, at attention and I guess there will be some questions. Thank you. Christos, are you alive? Hello? <laughs> or shall we switch to WhatsApp? Maybe he fall asleep. It was so boring that he fall. Shall I call him? Via WhatsApp or not? You think? Hello, hello. Hello. Yeah. Yes, of course. What happened? Christos, your, your microphone is not, it's, it's turned off. Ah, okay. Anyway, Yamas. <laughs> okay, Lucas, just give me one second and we will uh, continue. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So oh, let's, uh, because I think uh, Christos has uh, some uh, issues with uh, the microphone. 
Okay, and uh, just I want the uh, clarification from uh, the audience that uh, they can hear me uh, as well. Uh, I would like uh, to uh, to transfer some questions uh, to you, Lucas. Thanks. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, they ask if this fault is an active one. Yes. Yes. I didn't go into detail. This is uh, the so-called Seitzachtal Enstyle Störung, SEM fault system, uh, which is north of Hochschwab. It's a sinistral strike, strike slip fault. And since Miocene time, so approximately 20 million years ago, it started to evolve. And since that time, it moved about 70 kilometers. And this cave is uh, at one very small branch of this fault. And uh, we can, the, the, the spell attempts and the cave morphology document uh, offset of 30 centimeters. But we're not sure if it was seismic or aseismic. Most probably it was seismic, but we're not sure about that. Okay, okay. Uh, another question. Uh, you mentioned uh, before that uh, only one cave you found with uh, many speleothems. Uh, do you think there is a reason for uh, for this? Mm, there are, from time to time, you, you have different types of speleothems. What you quite often find is very old, corroded stuff. We try to date, it's older than half a million, which is the limit of the uranium taurine method. So maybe they are... Pliocene, early Pleistocene, when there was much more vegetation on Hochschwab, but presently there is only very little flowstone deposition. So in few places, in some caves, you find spell attempts, but Hirschgrubenhöhle, I would say, is an exception, uh, at least at an altitude of uh, 1,900 meters. Okay, okay, fair enough. Uh, another question is about uh, fossils. If you found uh, some uh, fossils anywhere? Uh, in one cave, I didn't mention Potentialschacht. It's also almost, uh, it's two kilometers long and 100 meters deep. We found three, at, at three places, very strange, remains of Ursospileus cave bear. Uh, juvenile ones, but we have no idea how it came there, because the entrance is super narrow and several drops going down, and these cave bears were in, in some boulder chalk with no connection to the surface, no nothing. We, we have no idea how it came there. Okay. Or uh, you fossils in the host rock. No, no, no. In, yeah. in fossils the, in the cave. Yes, in the cave. Yeah, yeah. In, uh, down at, Maybe one more sentence down at the valley. I mentioned Arzberghöhle. It's maybe 150 or 100 meters above Salzer Valley in the north. This was a real place for where the, where the Ursus Peleus uh, hibernated. And there, we don't know, several hundred uh, uh, cave bear were, were found or robbed, actually. And there are also artifacts from, from uh, prehistoric humans. Some, some, uh, okay. how you call it? I don't know. Okay, uh, you, uh, if I remember well, you mentioned uh, before uh, about the temperature in one cave that it was uh, two, three degrees. Uh, what is the the mean uh, temperature inside all these caves? All the all the caves they, they have this uh, temperature as well. So the, the cave, uh, the temperature, of course, is uh, depends on the elevation. And in many caves, you have ice throughout the year. So temperature is almost freezing. And I mentioned we, we explored some 500 caves and maybe 450 or 400 of them are blocked with snow or ice or with boulders. So most caves are, are blocked by, by ice. And if you go a little bit deeper, 
for example, in, in Hirschgrub Höhle, we measured is it was 1.8 1. 1. degrees. And if you go maybe a little bit deeper, about 1500 meters, maybe it is three degrees, four degrees. So it's not okay. really warm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, about the, the mapping, uh, what kind of uh, mm -hmm. instruments did you, did you use for the surveys? Uh, normally now we use this 2 x and uh, PDA with pocket topo for, I don't know, 10 years, I guess. Beginning of course was Sunto and tape and then Sunto and, and Disto and paper. And for, actually I don't know, but it's almost 10 years Disto X and PDA. Okay, nice, nice. And the last question. Uh, I, I think uh, I, I read all, all the questions. If uh, someone didn't uh, listen to uh, his, her question, please write it again. So one last question, uh, Lucas, is uh, in, in the beginning you mentioned uh, uh, a helicopter that uh, helped with uh, your things and the, the material and the gear and the equipment. And uh, we had a conversation in the chat uh, that, uh, you know, this is uh, something like uh, cheating and uh, you don't carry uh, the, the bags and the, all this, but uh, you have helicopters. So if, if you want to mention something like that. Um, so... The, the Schistel house is supplied only by helicopter. So all the food and the, and the wood and everything uh, is brought up by helicopter maybe three times a year. So, and this is, if the helicopter is already there, then it takes 10 minutes from, from the valley at 900 to fly up to 2,100. It's, it's quite cheap. It flies maybe 20 times, bring all, brings up all the beer, all the food, everything. And so it's quite cheap for us to bring the, the stuff to the, to the hut. And from there, we have to carry it to the cave and, and everything. Okay, okay. And the Do you think it's cheating if, if, if you use everything? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Do you, you, you think it is cheating if you use a helicopter? No. <laughs> uh, we, we had some uh, people uh, discussing this in uh, the chat room. Uh, while you were uh, speaking, okay. because for uh, for Greece it's uh, rare to use uh, in our expeditions uh, helicopter. Although in uh, uh, the 90s uh, we had we, we we used some helicopters in uh, the expedition of uh, deep caves in uh, Crete, especially. But you know this is something the rare for uh, for us. Uh, one more question, Lucas. Okay. We, we Sorry, but one, we don't we don't fly up with with helicopter. We still have to walk, and because the helicopter goes at least one month before our expedition, we still have to carry a lot of stuff. And 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 don't worry, we 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 sweat enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I I can imagine, I can imagine. And then uh, from the if it's another one and a half hour. Okay, uh, one more question from uh, Vaso. Uh, how many days can usually the expedition last in a selected number of caves at this uh, region? For example, do you choose only one cave or more for one expedition? Um, our style is that we, we plan one week at the beginning, end of August, beginning of September where maybe between eight and 12 or something like that, people stay on Schistelhaus and explore caves. And if the weather is okay, we can go to Steinbockschacht, which is the major, the major cave at the moment. Uh, not all uh, of the people want to go that deep and want to go that extreme. So who comes is okay. If, if not, it's also okay. There is still so many caves to explore. And then we fix some more dates in fall, where the weather is, is ideal, uh, to go. But last year we were not lucky. Hungarians were, but, but at, the, at that date, 
guys from our club could not join. Okay, okay, that's uh, fantastic, okay. Lucas. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, showing us uh, these uh, beautiful caves in the uh, Alps. It was amazing, and I like that you combined the uh, serving uh, and the uh, scientific uh, measurements and uh, exploring deep uh, caves. It was uh, amazing, I think. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Thanks for the invitation. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Yamas. Yamas. Bye-bye.